I just wanted to do one more example of this. I kind of messed up the details of the, the example at the end last time. Um, the subset construction. This is how to convert converts a NFA to a DFA. Uh, let's just do a new example. So we did one example of this last time. I'll call my states ABC this time. Is that confusing? How about XYZ? And what I'm drawing here is a NFA diagram. Sorry, I didn't might mean this epsilon to be there. Like that. How about this NFA diagram? So this one, if you care, this accepts um, anything of the form A, B to the N. But the diagram has some kind of extra nonsense down here. Like you can get A, B to the N by just going across the top. You do the A first and then B to the N and it will be accepted. Although you can also go down here, but actually what's accepted down here ends up being AA followed by, uh, sorry, that's, that's not what I meant to write. It accepts AB to the N or, or you could go the other way. Actually, it is different if you go the other way. The other way would be AB to the N, A, B to the M, something like that. Because you can go A first, then a bunch of Bs, then another A and a bunch of Bs and be accepted. So in this case, there's sort of two separate types of strings which can be accepted. All right. Anyway, I would like to do the subset construction to convert this to a DFA. And I hope you all remember vaguely how it goes. Uh, the idea is the DFA states are going to be sets of states from the original thing. And I begin with just the starting state is X. Uh, remember, the, the states down here are always they come from here by doing certain letters or possibly following epsilons. Now, there are no epsilons in this diagram, which makes it a little easier. But uh, my starting state here will be the set of x, all right? Because the only place you can get to when you start is just x, all right? If there were some epsilons here, you might also be able to uh, do, uh, you know, you might be able to get to y without doing any letters, but if there were epsilon here, but there isn't. so. It's just X there. All right. Uh, and now, where's the A arrow and the B arrow from X? For the A arrow, you ask yourself, starting from X up here, where can I get to by following an A and perhaps also doing some epsilons? And what do you say? From here, where can I get to by following an A? Yes. You can get to Y and Z. So the A arrow here goes to a state with Y and Z. That's because from X, if I do an A, I can get to either Y or Z. All right. Okay, what about from X? If I do a B, where can I get to? Uh, on this diagram, the answer is nowhere because there is no arrow with a B. And that means down here, we need, because my answer is supposed to be a DFA, it must have some arrow with a B. What's the set that I use to indicate you can't go nowhere? That is the empty set. All right. Okay, let's continue with the arrows then. So how about from Y comma Z, the A arrow. That means starting in either state Y and Z, if you do an A, where could you end up? What do you think? You have to kind of look carefully at the diagram. Anybody want to say? Yeah. Uh, just Y, yeah. If I start from Y or Z, where can I end up after doing an A? I believe you can you can go from Z to Y. So you can end up in Y, but that's it. You can't uh, can't make it to X or Z by doing an A. So um, if I do an A, uh, I can make it to just Y. Right. And from Y or Z, if I do B, where can we end up? I think in Y or Z, 
Doing a B, you can land again in Y or Z because the B just goes back on each of those. So here I'm going to put a B loop like that. Okay. Uh, we got to just make sure every state has two arrows. So uh, how about from just Y? I need an A arrow and a B arrow. From just Y, the A arrow, where does the A arrow go? The empty set, yeah, because from Y there is no A arrow. I saw someone making this hand motion. It's like that meme with, um, who's that guy? Jonah Hill. Yeah, uh, the A arrow from Y goes uh, nowhere. There is no A arrow. So the uh, down here, that means it goes to the empty set. Okay, and the B arrow from Y, uh, you can go back to Y from, with a B and, and nowhere else. So that is like this. And this is pretty much it. I need arrows from every state. That means you do need two outgoing arrows from the empty set state. But if you're doing this uh, correctly, they always are just going to be loops on the empty set. And what sort of what that means is if you start off nowhere, where can you get? And the answer is nowhere. All right. This is the, uh, the thing. Yeah, I just have like a general question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if there was additionally an A there, yeah. then this wouldn't be like that. It'd be like that. Right? Yeah, so it, it would be a little different. There are some, there are some instances where changing the diagram uh, a little bit up here would, would not result in any changes down here. But uh, in this case, uh, it would matter. Um, Okay, one last thing is we need to indicate the accepting states in, in, my, uh, in my diagram down here. And the way that that goes is any state, um, any set of states down here, which includes one of the accepting, will be accepted down here. And the Y is the accepting state on the original one. That means anything including a Y down here. Oh, anything including a Y down there. What? Sorry, I just draw some. can't undo those lines I just drew for some reason. It's all right. Uh, anything including a Y is accepting down here. So this, come on now. This is accepting here. This is accepting here. And I think that does it. All right. Great. Uh, can we talk for a moment about why this actually works? Um, why is it that the accepted strings in the second one are exactly the same as the accepted strings in the first one? Um, the way to think about this, I don't want to go through a detailed proof. There is actually a detailed proof in the book if you want to check it out. But um, the way that I think about this is, you know, if you look at the original NFA and you start in, in state X and you ask, what happens if I do an A? The answer is, well, I mean, you might go to Y or you might go to Z. In an NFA, it, it's kind of ambiguous and there is no um, specific answer. You kind of could go to both. And the, the idea of this machine down here is you are imagining kind of actually doing both. If you could actually from X and do A and you would actually end up doing both of them. This is like some kind of like a, like a multiverse kind of thing. If you imagine this, these are kind of like two parallel universes. This is saying, um, where can I go from X in any possible universe? The answer is you could go to Y or you could go to Z. And you could imagine those things as sort of happening simultaneously on two separate tracks or something. That's why X is going to this set, Y and Z. And then this arrow from Y, Z, and A indicates that if you're in either of these two sort of universes here and you did an A, actually you can only end up in this one after doing that A. All right. So what we have here is sort of um, this... I'm going to try and write in words what I'm saying here. This DFA simulates running the uh, NFA using all possible paths. 
right? It's kind of representing running every possibility simultaneously from the original um, DFA. And this is why all it takes to be accepting down here is that your set includes one of the accepting states up here. So the fact that Y comma Z is accepting, it's because one of those possible like universes involves an accepting state which means that string should be accepted. So this DFA simulates running the NFA using all possible paths. And if one path was accepted in the NFA, it is accepted in this DFA. And that's why the DFA is, is equivalent to the NFA, because it, it represents the same thing, just sort of running a bunch of branches simultaneously. But it has the same underlying computation happening. All right. I would like for you all to try one. I got one for you to see what you think. There will be some more of these to practice on the homeworks, but I want to see if see how you do with one of these. Uh, so I have a DFA in five states and I would like you to convert to uh, NFA. This one I just named the states like one, two, three, four, five. So Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. This one's gonna be a little trickier because it has some epsilons in it. Q5 is the only accepting state. That's it. Your job is to do the subset thing. There are five states here. That means there are actually many, many possible subsets, but it turns out the DFA, if you do it correctly, will only use three states. So if you end up getting a huge diagram, it means you messed it up. And unfortunately, if you mess it up at the beginning, it screws the whole thing. Maybe just to get us going, can anybody say, what should, what should we start at, the starting state? Remember, the starting state in your subset machine consists of the original starting state plus whatever you can reach by a epsilon from the original starting state. So what should that be? Yeah? Q1 and Q4, yeah. This is my starting state in the DFA. And then can we, maybe we'll just, let's just draw one arrow together. Where's the A arrow from there? You will see immediately. This is a little a little tricky in this example. Where's the A arrow? It means starting from either of these states, Q1 and Q4, if you do an A, possibly um, also epsilons also. So if you do an A, possibly in combination with some epsilons, where are the states you could end up with in? Q1, yes, you can end up in Q1 by doing this. Can you end up anywhere else? By doing an A, possibly also doing epsilons? Everyone's saying no. I think the answer is yes. Where else? Uh, you yes, you can also end in Q4 by starting here and doing A followed by epsilon. So this is, the epsilon it makes this a little tricky, all right? You can end up in Q1 by just doing A here, or you, you can also end up in Q4 by doing A followed by epsilon. Anywhere else? Now you may be worried, maybe you could get all kinds of other weird places, but actually in this example you can't get anywhere else because this epsilon only goes right here. There's no way to make it across here by doing A. So where does the A arrow go? It goes like that in this example. Q1, Q4 goes back to Q1, Q4. Yeah. For all of them, like you have to kind of pay attention to the epsilons? You have to pay attention to the epsilons, yeah. The example that I just did had no epsilons in it, which actually makes it much easier. I mean, it's not theoretically any different, but there are, you have to be very careful about the details. 
So I'll let you uh, try and do the rest. Remember I said, if you do this right, you're only going to end up using three states in your answer. If you end up getting more than that, you messed it up. I'll give you a few minutes. I'll come around and see how you're doing. Thank you. 
All right, can we talk about this one? This is, uh, as you've, you've learned, very easy to uh, mess up the details in one like this. It's mostly due to the epsilon, which can confuse a lot of things. Uh, so the B arrow, can we talk about the B arrow? From either of these two states, if you do B, you can end up back in Q1 by doing this B. You can end up in Q2 by doing this B. Uh, you can end up in Q4 by doing this B followed by epsilon. And you can end up in Q5 by doing this B. So this arrow goes to Q1, Q2, Q3, not three, sorry, four and five. I think everybody eventually uh, decided that, although uh, it might have taken a few false starts to, uh, to get that. All right. Now, more arrows. I need arrows from here now. So let's look at one, two, four, five. You have to kind of look at this picture and hold all of these in your head at the same time and say, what if I do an A, where could I end up? I could end up again in Q1 by doing this A. I could also do Q1, uh, this A followed by epsilon to end up in Q4. And I could also do this A to end up in Q3. So, and I think that's all. So I think the, uh, the A arrow from here should go to one, four, and three. Anybody disagree? I think that's what it should be. One, four, and three, I'll put that here. Maybe I'll write one, three, and four in order. All right, that's the A arrow. I said there's only gonna be three states, so I arrange them like that. Okay, what about the B arrow from the big one here? One, two, four, five, doing a B. Again, I, I'm trying to look at all of these four states sort of simultaneously. Where can I go with a B? I can go back here, so I can reach Q1 with a B. I can reach Q2 by doing this. I can reach Q4 by doing B followed by epsilon, and I can reach Q5 by doing this B, but I cannot reach Q3 by doing a B. So I think that means the B arrow is like this. You can get back to any of those. You cannot get back to Q3 though. All right, and then I just need two arrows from here, one, three, four. Uh, so from one, three, four, that's these two plus this one over here. If I do a A, it can go back to Q1. It can also do this followed by epsilon to make it to Q4, but you cannot get anywhere else with an A from these three states. So that goes like that. And then with a B, 
one, three, four, here, here, and here. Doing a B, I can go here uh, to Q1. I could go across here to get to Q2. I could do this one followed by epsilon to get to Q4, and I could go from here to here to get to Q5. That's back to this one. So I think it's like that. This is what I got. Anyone have any uh, comments or complaints? It's easy to mess these up, but uh, that's what I got. All right, and finally, which one, if any, is accepting? It should be anything including a Q5, which would be only this one in this example. Anything including a Q5, like so. All right, any, uh, any comments about that? Somebody asked me as I was walking around, this is a good comment actually, isn't this kind of stupid here? In the original NFA, actually, the person who asked me this didn't use the S word. Isn't this kind of stupid that it just like goes over here, but this, this is not an accepting state. So what's the point of that? And my answer is, yeah, actually, that doesn't do anything in this NFA. This is just like extra diagram, which has no effect on anything. Um, why did I even put it in there? Uh, it's because this was a typo. On my paper, this was also an accepting state. Um, so. <laughs> That's a considerably more interesting NFA example. Although, actually, what difference does it make? It doesn't really make much of a difference. Can anyone say what difference does it make in terms of the answer, the, the second one? Yeah. The bottom one also be yeah, that's the only difference. It doesn't actually change any of the arrows or anything else. But uh, if you want to make this accepting, just so that, the, so that it's not a stupid NFA, then the only difference is this also becomes accepting. Sorry for giving you a stupid example like that. All right, excellent. That will do it for the subset construction. Like I said, there, there's gonna be some more uh, on the homework for you to try out. Um, that's how we do it. So can I just say something sort of by way of, of summarizing this, what we've been talking about lately? Um, the fact that that procedure we just did, the fact that that is even possible, it means, this means that NFA and DFA have the same uh, computational power because it is possible to translate one into the other. That means anything you could do with the NFA, you can also do with the DFA. And conversely, anything you could do with the DFA, you can also do with the NFA. That's actually much simpler. That's because the DFA already is at NFA, but the more interesting one is the fact that you can change an NFA around to make it into a DFA, all right? So the NFA and the DFA has the same computational power. Um, they both can compute the, uh, there was this, a name, anybody remember? We haven't said this word a lot, but we are gonna say it a lot going forward. A name for the set of all languages that can be computed by a DFA? Anybody remember the name? These are the... Uh, no, that was something, but not, not what I'm thinking. The regular languages, yeah. They both can compute the set of regular languages. All right? That's the definition of what a regular language is. A regular language is one which you can compute using a DFA or equivalently using an NFA. They're the same, all right? Um, this is any language which can be computed by, actually, people who uh, are familiar with the subject already or Ordinarily, when we talk about this, you would just say any language which can be computed by a finite state machine. And what is meant by that is NFA or DFA. And it doesn't really matter which one because they're the same, uh, the same power. A finite state machine, that means NFA or DFA. So if you're talking to somebody in the club or whatever 
they'll say, oh yeah, I talk, I like, uh, I like finite state machines. Don't say, oh, you mean NFA or DFA? You'll embarrass yourself. Like, it doesn't matter. They're, like, they're not exactly the same, but if you're talking from a theoretical point of view, they, they are interchangeable because any NFA can always be converted into a DFA. All right. They are called the finite state machines or finite automata, some people call them. When somebody just says finite automata, what they mean is a NFA or a DFA. All right. Uh, that means, can I say one sort of uh, abstract fact that this means? So that means, I'll say we've seen already that regular languages are closed under, I'll just remind you of this fact. Remember what closed under means is if you take two regular languages and combine them in some way, the result is also a regular language. And they are closed under union and intersection. All right. Uh, and also complements. Complements. The union and the intersection are done by the, um, this is the product construction for DFAs. That's what we did on the quiz, right? Um, the complement, this is a simple trick for DFAs, simple DFA trick. If I give you a DFA and I want you to make a DFA for the complement, you just interchange all of the accepting and rejecting states. You make every accepting state rejecting and every rejecting state accepting. Uh, so that shows that if you start with a regular language, the complement is also a regular language. Um, and then they're also closed under uh, set differences. This, this you did a homework problem about. I don't know if you recall, but the set difference like L, L1 minus L2, that's the same as L1 intersect L2 complement. And so you can do the complement trick and then the intersection trick. Uh, there were, that was on a homework problem. And then one last thing is uh, concatenation. Actually, concatenation is hard to do with DFAs, but it's easy to do with NFAs. And that was this trick, this sort of combining two machines like that, which we talked about last time. So some of these, these are five different closure properties. Some of them are easy to see using DFAs. Some of them are easy to see using NFAs, but they're, they're, they're kind of interchangeable. So um, all of these things are properties of any regular language, all right? This is sort of a summary, I suppose, of everything that we've done uh, so far, all being about DFAs and NFAs. Any, any thoughts about that? I'm about to start talking about something completely different then. We've got about 20 minutes left. We can get started on our next section. Uh, this next section is yet another kind of machine, although this one you'll see pretty quickly that we don't usually talk about it like a machine. So the, the, uh, the way that we describe these things is actually quite different, but you'll see pretty quickly it's, it's a similar abstract idea at least. I would like to talk about something called regular expressions. If you've done some fancy programming, you might actually know about regular expressions. If you've seen this in your uh, computer science classes, it means the same thing uh, as regular, regular expressions used in, in uh, programming. And uh, there are some programming languages and some types of programming tasks where people use regular expressions all the time in the real world. Uh, they are super powerful to do, mostly to do manipulations with strings, if you care about that, which, uh, you know, sometimes you do. Um, it is another type of machine, I suppose, although the language that we use to discuss regular expressions, uh, we don't typically think of it in the same way. So it's a type of machine, but with um, no states or arrows, which is why we don't really think of it as a machine because the way you represent it is so different. Um, 
No states are arrows, but it is, um, or they, you know, each, reg each individual regular expression, they describe certain sets of accepted strings. And so we can think of them in the same way as our machines. You know, our machines we think of as you give it a string and it either accepts or rejects that string. And a regular expression works in the same way. You can uh, sort of propose a string and ask, does this regular expression accept or reject that particular string? You don't draw a diagram for it. It, it looks something like this. So a regular expression, people often write this, reg for regular expression, I don't know how this is supposed to be pronounced actually. Regex or regix. I will pronounce that word as regular expression, but I will write regix. Uh, a regular expression um, looks something like this. Here's just an example. How about this? All right, and in our remaining 20 minutes today, I would like to explain enough so that you will understand what all that means. Um, it looks like a sort of nonsensical jumble of A's and B's, I suppose are not much of a surprise, but it also includes these operations, the star and the plus, and those are really the only operations in a regular expression, all right? Um, and so in this case, this regular expression, once you know how to interpret that, uh, this defines a language. Which we write naturally like L of R, which is similar to the language accepted by a DFA or an NFA. Um, and in this example, like I can, I, just because I know how to read regular expressions, um, here AB is actually part of the language of this particular regular expression. And how do you know that? I mean, it's basically because there are, there's like a little piece of this. In fact, the reason AB is, is in the language here is actually because of that AB right there. You might think it's because of this one, but actually it's not. You have to understand how to read this. But um, AB is part of the language of this regular expression. Now, if this was a machine, I would, I would say AB is accepted, but this is just like a cultural thing. People talk about regular expressions differently. Uh, we say... You don't use the word accepted here. We say um, R, the regular expression, not accepted, but we say matches the string AB. So don't say accept or reject. This is another, another club hack. When you're talking about regular expressions in the club, don't say they accept or reject. They, People will know what you mean, but the proper verbiage is it matches the string, or I don't think there is an opposite. It does not match the string. All right? Don't say accept or reject for regular expressions. We say it matches. Okay, so let's just try to sort of break this down and talk about what all of these things mean. Um, what you see inside a regular expression, it includes sort of bits and pieces of strings. So the letters in there... The letters sort of, uh, there's not much to say about the letters. They kind of represent themselves. So when you see a A right there, that actually means like the letter A from the, le from the alphabet. Um, what is interesting, uh, so, and, and also I can say the parentheses are sort of usual grouping things. So the parentheses in a regular expression have exactly the same meaning as in mathematics. They're just used to group things. Grouping things. Don't say that in the club. Uh, there must be a better way to say that, but the parentheses are used for grouping things. And then uh, what we really should talk about is the plus and the star. Those are the interesting operations to discuss for making sense of regular expressions. All right. Uh, so what about two main operations, the plus and the star? Uh, 
Uh, let's just talk about them. So the plus, what the plus means, the plus is like or, or union. That's your interpretation of a plus in a regular expression, all right? So for example, if I have just a very simple regular expression, a, B plus A. What is matched by this regular expression? The answer is this one matches A, B, and it also matches A. So the plus right there just means like a union or a or or something. It means this matches any string which looks like this one or looks like this one. So this one matches A, B, or A. All right, and so if you want to write this technically speaking, the language of R is simply A, B, and A. It only matches two different strings, and those are them right there, A, B, and A. This is the language of that particular regular expression. The plus just means something like or or union. Yeah? Uh, can you just go for a second so I can... Sure. I, yeah. Not very interesting, <laughs> I'm afraid. All right. This is what the plus means. In general, if you have something like, uh, if you want to write this in a slightly fancier way, generally speaking, if I have L of, say, R1 plus R2, if I have two different things added together in a regular expression, what's the language of that? It's equal to the language of the first one, union, the language of the second one. This is sort of saying the same thing in more technical set theory language. Two regular expressions added together with the plus means you just match either the first one or the second one, or, or possibly both. That's what union means. Okay, that's the plus. Not too complicated. What about the star? The star is also not too complicated. The star is for repetitions. Actually, it means the same thing as the star that we have been using in class so far, although we've been using it mostly in unsophisticated ways. Like I write something like A comma B star. That means all possible strings which can be made up using A's and B's over and over again. Now, when I say over and over again or repetition, I don't really mean you repeat the same thing exactly. Like when I say A comma B star, that doesn't mean just A over and over again or just B over and over again. It means you are repeatedly using things of this format, but they don't have to be the same every time. All right, so anyway, the star is for repetition. It means it matches the preceding thing zero or more times. So this, when I say repetition or iteration or something, we always allow for zero times uh, in your repetition, which may be slightly confusing, I guess. But anyway, what that means is A star, this matches any repetitions of A over and over again. So that is empty string or A or A squared or A cubed, etc. Right. If you want to be fancy about it, you could write it this way. L of A star, the language matched by A star is A to the N for all N in the natural numbers. Right. Uh, what about, you know, you could also do B star, and that's just empty string or B or B squared or B, B cubed, etc. Uh, a little more interesting, what about A plus B parentheses star? So the parentheses is used as a sort of grouping, and this means any repetition of things like this, and those things, they can be either A or they can be B, all right? Uh, and they don't have to be the same choice every time. Every time through, you get to choose which, uh, which string you like. So this matches, can you say, like, can you say in words what kinds of strings can you make like that? You go through this zero or more times, and each time you can choose an A or a B. This is maybe somewhat of a trick question. I don't know if you feel like the answer is kind of stupid. Some people were going to answer, but now they don't. They didn't think their answer was stupid. What? Uh, any number of A's and any number of B's. 
Yes, this is not quite stupid enough. Um, because, like I said, when you do this re repeating thing, you don't have to make the same choice every time. So inside here, it could be either an A or a B. And you're going to do that over and over again. But each time through, you could choose the A one the first time and a B the second time and so on. What is, so what can you end up with? Yeah? We just end up with like any string. With those. Any string at all. Yeah, this is the somewhat stupid answer I was looking for. Um, this matches any string of A's and B's. All right. Actually, as a set, that's the same as uh, it's the same as this A comma B star. It means you uh, can do any like repetition is not really the right word to use, although there isn't a great alternative word in English for what you're doing. You are doing this pattern over and over again, but each individual instance of the pattern can either be an A or a B. All right. Uh, how about, is this any different from A star plus B star? Are they the same or different? I think they are different, actually. Can anybody say what's, what's different about this? This means you either do A star or you do B star. That's not the same. Anyone say the difference? Yeah? Yeah, this one is going is actually going to be either only A's or only B's, right? Because this one means it has to be only A's, or you could do this one, which means it has to be only B's, but there's no opportunity to mix them about. So this matches anything like A to the N or B to the N, and those are different, all right? So there is no kind of, uh, you might wonder if there's like a distributive property for the star and the plus. The answer is no, they're not equal. One is a subset of the other, but they're not equal. All right. Excellent. Can we talk, uh, let's just look at some slightly more complicated things. Now, there is actually sort of one more hidden operation, which you usually don't have to think much about. But one more operation is concatenation. So what I mean by that is you can do something like A star B. So this involves A star stuck right next to a B. And it means sort of what you think it means. This matches strings like A star followed immediately by B. All right. And so this one will match strings like B or AB or A squared B, AQB, etc. You do the A star part first, and then you must do a B after it. So this is, I mean, this also counts technically as an operation, even though you don't, you don't write it with a symbol or anything. All right, this is the concatenation. OK, let's just look at a few examples. Uh, and then, you know, we're, uh, we're about ready to go today, I think. So how about something like uh, A, how about A star, B star? What does that match? This means some bunch of A's first. That's what the A star is and then followed immediately by some bunch of B's. So this one matches A to the N, B to the M, something like that. Because it has some block of A's first, followed by some block of B's. And these blocks may individually be like of length zero, if you want, uh, because the star allows for zero matches, like matches of zero terms, all right? Uh, how about A plus B squared star? What do you think of that? Anybody want to try and describe in words what uh, what that is? Yeah? Uh, it involves uh, either an A or two consecutive Bs in a row, uh, and they can either go first or last. It doesn't matter where they are in the string. Yeah, so this is any string which can be built out of A's and B squareds. So when you see B's, they have to be together in groups of two. 
but this uh, th and there's no real fancy way to write that but this matches any strings made up of a's and b squareds so I'm talking about something like a a b b a or a b b a b b but not something like a b a that's not allowed because this one has just a single b all alone which is not allowed all right yeah great um maybe for the f we got we got five minutes remaining uh i wanted to show you a little bit and then we'll we'll talk some more about this next time um with um regular expressions real life regular expressions on the computer uh so like I said before, these are used all the time, used often in real programming. Regular expressions are very handy for doing sort of simple, stupid string manipulations, which are a real pain to do with uh, sort of coding things by hand in Python or whatever, but are very simple to do using regular expressions. Um, for example, um, the, in, uh, if you use a, a Mac, you can do this exactly as I'm doing it, but you can also do it on Windows also. There's a built-in terminal command um, in any kind of Unix type system, including the Mac OS. I'm going to turn on my terminal here. I hope you can see that all right. So the terminal command that I'm going to use is called egrep, which means uh, e is for, oh, sorry, you can't see what I'm writing anymore. I can see the side over here. All right. This means general regular expression. Sorry. Print. And it's used for looking through a giant uh, text file and showing you everything which matches the regular expression which you say. Um, so each, um, uh, it reads a text file and prints any line of the file where there's a match of the regular expression. So what I have, and um, I'm going to put this on the class website so you can play around with it if you like to. I have a file called um, words, wordsen.txt is a giant list of 10,000, I believe, uh, words in the English language. And so this, I don't know if you use the, the Mac uh, terminal or uh, Linux or something. This cat is just going to print out the entire contents of the file onto the line. And there they are. It ends with zizivas down here. They're in alphabetical order. They're all lowercase in this file. It's every, it's, well, it's 10,000 words from the English language. Some of them are debatable, like a zowie is here, uh, but they got to, you know, you got to draw the line somewhere. Um, so I can, rather than just printing out the entire file, I can do something like egrep, and then you put your regular expression in quotes. Um, maybe I'll put ABB and then the name of the file. This is the file to search through. So what it's going to do, like I said over there, it prints any line of the file where there was a match. So it's going to print out any line which matches that regular expression, which is ABB. So these are all the words which have ABB in them somewhere, all right? Such as swabbies, all right? Unabbreviated is a nice one. Um, but, you know, that's not, not terribly interesting. I can do something like BEP. There are, anybody know a word that has BEP in it? Maybe not. There's only two of them, hebephrenia and hebephrenic. All right. Um, it's a little more interesting to put actual regular expressions in there. So you can do, let's do TO star TH. So remember what the star means. It, now the star, because I didn't put parentheses or anything, that means this star applies only to the thing which immediately precedes it. So what I'm looking for is any word which has a T followed by some amount of O's and then another TH. Anybody want to predict a word that has that format? 
Tooth, yes, tooth has that format. Um, you, you will also expect, you know, toothbrush, toothpaste, other variations on the word tooth. And there's, there's probably some more, right? Oh, I forgot to type, sorry, I gotta put the name of the file. Okay, here we are. So you can see like tooths, tooths, toothless. Um, how about Matthew? Was anyone expecting Matthew? Can anybody say, why is that in there? Yeah? Yeah, the star allows for zero repetitions of the letter O. And so what that has is T followed by no O's followed by TH. So that also still um, matches the pattern. We got heart throbs also, which is similar. It has T, TH with no O in between. All right, we're gonna do some more, um, some more examples.